passiamo la parola adesso all'amica collega Emma Richardson dello University College di Londra eh, dove insegna scienze dei materiali applicati ai beni culturali con particolare enfasi ai materiali organici in particolare plastiche eh, e, e cose di questo genere sia artificiali che naturali eh, ha preso il PhD all'Università di Southampton e poi è stata in chimica analitica e poi è stata per un triennio al Getty Conservation Institute di Los Angeles e credo che ci parlerà di ricerche fatte in quell'ambiente. Ritorneremo al minimalismo americano a cui accennava, questa volta della, della West Coast e il lavoro e in collaborazione anche con Tom Lerner e con Rachel Rivack. E vorrei come ultima cosa eh, accennare al grande contributo che ha dato nell'ambito del progetto europeo Pop Art, eh, progetto che si è concluso con molto successo, in cui le plastiche hanno avuto un ruolo determinante, come, lo, come è il caso che lo sia. Grazie Antonio. Buonasera, sono Emma Richardson. Uh, mi parlo un po' italiano, so I will be speaking in English from here on, okay, to save my embarrassment and your embarrassment also. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, today I will talk a little bit about some of the work that was coming out of West Coast America during the 1960s and 1970s. Um, the work that I'm presenting here today um, is part of um, an exhibition that I was co-curator um, with Tom Lerner and Rochelle Rivenk um, at the Jean-Paul Getty Museum um, a couple of years back. Um, so obviously I would like to, to credit them as well with, with regards to this work. Um, Probably easier. Um, so on the west coast of America, um, west coast minimalist artists were very much synonymous with um, uh, reflective light and immersive light. Um, the artists um, working at that time um, often were called Finnish fetish, art, Finnish fetish artists or light and space artists. And they were very much focused on very pristine surfaces and works of art where we have these pared down pieces, this kind of palette cleansing in relation to the works of art and these very ambiguous boundaries um, within the works. Now these artists were effectively making use of very, very innovative materials at that time um, on, the, on the West Coast. Um, in post-war America, post-Second World War America, um, there was decommissioning of a lot of materials from the military, um, aerospace, um, with the space race, we had an, a, an awful lot of new materials coming through, um, surfboard culture and the automobile culture. So these artists were very much kind of experimenting with new materials. There was uh, materials exploration and experimentation in order to try and achieve these pared down boundaries and these, uh, these pieces with near in existence. Whilst a lot of the works of art um, very much chimed into the stereotypes of Los Angeles, um, such as the Hollywood billboards and as I say automobile culture um, and surfboard culture, um, these pieces were not mass-produced pieces. Um, these were, pieces were very much um, industry and craft with an awful lot of work going into to achieving these, these beautiful, smooth surfaces um, and pared down sculptures. Um, and first I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a few of the artists that were key players um, within the scene and then I will move on to talk about one artist in particular and some conservation implications. So what you see here um, is a sculpture called Green Wedge by an artist called Peter Alexander. And he was a number of artists working on the west coast of America um, using polyester resin, um, which at the time was quite, quite a new material and certainly was something very new in terms of artists um, manipulating this material and you can see here that this beautiful sculpture um, it tapers out to near in existence um, as we as we our eyes drawn up through through the object 
here we see Larry Bell, a piece by Larry Bell. Um, Larry Bell was a true innovator um, within this group of artists, although not really working with polyester resin, um, which is my main focus. Um, Larry Bell was using a, an industrial technique, an industrial me metal deposition technique, um, where he was applying coatings of different metals such as nickel and aluminium onto the surface of prefabricated panes of glass. And he was producing uh, glass walls and glass cubes um, in which the reflection of the exterior um, was reflected within the interior of the piece. So, so one's perspective is altered in relation to the work of art. Um, here um, is a piece by Robert Irwin, who is probably the most well-known amongst this group of artists um, on the west coast of America. Um, here we see this, this uh, 12 foot tall um, acrylic prism, um, again manipulating light, and as you walk around the piece you actually don't see um, your reflection in, in, in it at all. Um, you see the reflection of the light and the diffraction of the light through this piece. Um, and this is Helen Pashkin. She's somewhat of an anomaly within this group of artists. This was very much a, a macho, male-oriented uh, group of artists working with, the, with these innovative materials. So Helen Pashkin was one of only a couple of artists working on the West Coast within this group. Um, and what we see here is we see um, uh, the manipulation of two different types of plastic. So we have this, this um, interior coil um, of acrylic um, resin, and this is then surrounded by polyester resin. And she was very much making use of the interplay of the boundaries of these two materials and the way in which the light reflects and behaves differently when it interacts with these two different materials. And as you move around the piece, you see the subtleties of, of, of that interplay. Uh, now, here conveniently, the alphabet brings us to Dwayne Valentine, who is the artist that I would like to focus on a little bit this, this afternoon. Um, Dwayne Valentine was very much interested in working polyester resin um, and interested in achieving these very, very smooth finished surfaces um, and the interplay with light on the actual works of art. Um, and what you see here, we see some, uh, a piece called Diamond Column. This is an eight foot high um, piece of polyester. Um, it is 12 inches in the center of the diamond and it tapers to less than an inch at the edge, uh, edge at either edge of the piece. And um, very much manipulating light as, as, the, as you walk behind it, you can see, possibly if I can get this laser to work, you can see the lady walking in from the left, but in the center, it flips the, 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 the image. So we get this inversion, we get this play on light um, due to the, the material and the angles in which he was, he was working with. Now, what sets Dwayne Valentine apart from the other artists is that he was very much interested in pushing the material boundary. Um, he was not satisfied with, you, with using off-the-shelf resins that had been developed for other applications. He very much wanted to see where he could push the material for his, for his, his vision. Um, and so here you see um, a grey column, um, which is a 12-foot high piece. Um, and the, what's interesting about Valentine is that before Valentine came along, it was only possible to cast polyester resin in very, very thin pieces. The reaction in terms of curing polyester resin is an exothermic one, so a lot of heat is given out, um, and in the process, if the material is on mass, then the material will crack, so the objects fail. So you lose an awful lot of material, and it's very expensive for an artist. Um, so Duane was very much interested in pushing that boundary to achieve this vision that we, that we see here. So what we have is we have a 12 foot high piece, we have an 8 foot wide um, uh, diameter. Um, at the base it is an, just an inch thick and it tapers, uh, uh, just over a foot thick and it ta tapers to, to just an inch um, uh, at the top. Um, a very, very smooth surface, and this was something that was not possible um, before Duane came along. So, how did he actually manage to create this piece? Well, what you see here is you see a, note, an, a page from one of his notepads in relation to his process. And Duane Valentine actually um, came together with, with Pittsburgh Plate Glass, who were uh, a manufacturing company in Pittsburgh. 
Um, and he very carefully um, worked tirelessly for a number of years trying to develop a material with them um, that would enable him to cast polyester resin on such a large scale rather than these thin single sheets. Um, and so the, eventually um, the product was actually sold on the market as Valentine's mass cast resin. Um, so it became a co commercial pro um, polyester resin which other artists could then, could then use. Um, and you can see here from the note that the notepad that he has these meticulous notations. Here we've got this excess exotherm, the piece is fractured. This idea that he was both an engineer and an artist and experimenting with materials was very key into the, in the development of these works. So, what is polyester? I can hear you all crying. <laughs> uh, well, it's something that we're all familiar with. Uh, we have bottles that are made from it. Um, we have synthetic fibers that are made from it. Um, surfboards are, are obviously from LA. It would be wrong to not have a, an image of a surfboard up there. So it's something that we're very, very familiar with. Um, it's ubiquitous to us. Um, and in terms of actually what we're looking at, this is a very basic structure. So this is, this is the science bit, and then we will move on to the conservation bit. Um, how am I doing for time, Antonio? Great. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so what we've got here is we actually have uh, a schematic of the polyester resin, okay? So this structure is just to give you an idea of what's going on. We have this long chain here, okay, and this would, this would repeat many thousands of times. If we think on a molecular scale, this would repeat many, many times. Um, and it's called an unsaturated polyester resin. And it's unsaturated because... We have, these ring, we have these bonds here, okay, that allow the structure to open up and to react to form a solid material. It starts off life as a viscous material, a little bit like honey, um, and it reacts to form a solid material. And it's the presence of these bonds that allow it to react to form this solid material. So we add a catalyst to the material, and those bonds will open up, and that will react with these, this material here, which is called styrene. And the best way to think about all of this on a molecular level is that you have a bowl of cooked pasta, which is this long chain here. And then we have lots of olives, which is this here, okay? And we add a catalyst to it, and it causes this reaction to occur, and we end up with a solid material, which is the polyester resin, okay? So we end up with many, many structures like this, so we end up with lots and lots of links, and the, the material becomes very, very rigid. So it started off life as a, as a liquid and, and ends as, as a solid. Um, here you can see Dwayne Dwight Valentine in his studio. Um, this is the mixing process. These are uh, the barrels here of polyester resin, and to this he would add uh, colorants to it, depending on the sculpture, he would, he would add, add different colorants to it, and slowly mix this up. This would take a couple of hours to get a very homogeneous material. It's a very thick, um, viscous material. He would then add the catalyst to it, which would then start the reaction moving, and at which point he would need to move to the pouring, to the casting of the actual pieces themselves. So here you can see Duane on the left-hand side and his two, two helpers in, in the studio. And you can see the mould for Grey Column just behind them. Um, to cast a piece like Grey Column, it would take um, about 10 barrels of polyester resin. Um, and to pour the resin from here into the actual mould, it would take up to two hours for that to actually move through the filter into the mould. So we're obviously talking about a very, very long process in terms of the production of the, of the sculpture. Um, whilst, whilst one barrel was pouring into the mould, they would then be preparing the second barrel um, to actually to move forwards with this. And they would remain in the studio for up to 48 hours. They would, after, after the, uh, the casting had, had started, they would then have to remain with the piece until it had actually cured. Um, as I say, the process gives out heat. Um, there is a lot of dimensional changes that occur to the actual mold itself, um, which means that they need to remain with the piece to ensure that it's stable. 
Um, Dwayne Valentine often talks about um, an accident that occurred with one of his other pieces that's at the Norton Simon Museum, um, Norton Simon Museum in California. Um, where the, the mould actually started to crack during the curing process and he had to commandeer um, his colleagues to come and hold it back together again. And if you go and see that piece, you can see in the top corner that bubbles have formed through the actual polyester resin um, relating back to that occasion when the mould started to, to give way. Um, so once it comes out of the mould, um, it is, the surface is very, very rough. Um, so we end up with a very, very rough material, um, which you can have a feel here. Um, so the material then needs polishing, very similar to the way that we might deal um, with a cast bronze, where we, may have to, where we have to chisel and we have to chase the surface to produce a very, very fine, smooth surface. Um, the same is true for um, these works of art as well. There needs to be a lot of work put in to produce these very, very seamless um, pieces. So here you can see uh, Dwayne Valentine on the right-hand side, and again his studio hands here, polishing the piece. Um, and they would use these very big um, polishers that would be used for car manufacturing. Um, and it, uh, accounts tell us that it would take up to three weeks of continuous, continuous polishing. Um, three people continuously polishing um, with different gradations of sandpaper to produce this perfect, perfect surface, um, which we see here, okay? So, when the surface is key to functionality, does the surface supersede issues of the artist's hand, preservation, and conservation? When these pieces are inherently linked to these high shine surfaces and the reflection of light and the, the immersive effect um, of light, then what are the issues in relation to the conservation and the preservation of such works of art? Um, Plastics have a bit of a reputation for being really very uh, persistent in the environment. Now, whilst that is obviously true, um, their form will um, inevitably change. Uh, they will start to react with their environment. Um, we will have alterations in the colour and the dimensions of the material. So although we end up with masses of plastic in the environment, from a conservation point of view, any alteration to the material is very significant um, in terms of a collection and the care of these pieces. Um, so this poses a challenge. Plastics pose a huge challenge for conservation. Not only do plastics pose a huge challenge for conservation, the fact that a lot of these artists are still alive or their foundations are very much an influence means that the conversations with regards to how we go about treating a work of art um, that differ from, from much older works um, and traditional conservation practices within, within museums and heritage. In terms of these pieces specifically, um, there are three primary challenges. Um, we have mechanical damage, we have chemical alterations, and we have improved technologies. Here you can see one of Dwayne Valentine's pieces again. Uh, this is Red Concave Circle from the 1970s. Um, and in the upper image, you can see that there has been a chip, a very large chip, which relates to this edge down here. Um, now, although polyester resin is very strong, um, it is also very brittle. And so it very, very clearly shows damage. And the surface is very easily damaged, which obviously with these pieces is problematic. Um, so what one does in relation to conservation... Five minutes, OK. Thank you. <laughs> what one does in relation to conservation um, is very much up for discussion. But I think most people, given the nature of these pieces and the damage, would think it would be OK to actually infill these works of art um, in order to not have your eye drawn to this damage. 
However, that may be fairly easy to solve, but these materials also have inherent instability, as I, as I mentioned, and we get chemical alterations occurring in the surface. Here we see on the bottom left-hand side um, the surface of one of Duane Valentine's maquettes, so one of his proprietary, proprietary pieces. Um, and over time, over 30 years, um, there has been some movement in the polyester resin, okay? A proportion of the material is still fluid, and it has actually moved to the surface of the piece, which is obviously very distracting in relation to the work of art. Um, now, the, the conversations with regards to whether or not we treat these um, very much is up for discussion again. If it was a natural bronze and the patina, given that this is part of the material itself, we would not necessarily move, remove that. Whereas with these new contemporary pieces, this is very, very distracting. However, it is still inherently part of the work. Um, it shows a history, it shows a life. Um, and those discussions as to whether we would remove it is something that's very, very significant in, in terms of our practice as conservators and conservation scientists. Um, here, further alterations can be seen insofar as the polyester resin will yellow over time. Um, we have a, a piece here by Peter Alexander, which has been stored um, in a window for the past 40 years in the California sunlight. Um, and it has yellowed what was once a crystal clear work of art is now very, very yellow on the surface. Now, we could very easily sand back the surface to produce a much more clear piece, um, but then we would be losing the interaction of the artist and the artist's hand on that surface. And so, again, we have these discussions as whether the material is important or whether, the, and, or whether it's the perception of the piece that is actually the, at, um, at stake here. And then we move to the problems of improved technologies. In 2014, it's possible to make more perfect the surface um, that was possible in the 1970s. Um, and many artists would claim that had they had the opportunities that they have now, then they would have used those technologies in order to produce a more perfect surface to the work of art. Um, a number of foundations and artists will argue that it, they would rather put the new surface onto the work than have um, the work, the surface contemporary to the piece itself. So, is the material immaterial? One more slide, I promise. <laughs> um, to my mind, it is not immaterial. Um, the surface is very much integrally part and um, integrally linked to a particular economy, a particular industry, and a particular location. Um, although many of these artists feel that the material is not the message, to quote uh, Bob Irwin, um, they are very much linked to um, a more societal and a historical aspect. Um, and if we just remove those surfaces and we do not consider the material in our conservation, um, then that is something that we may live to regret in the future. That doesn't mean, however, that there isn't a conversation to be had. Obviously, we find ourselves in a fairly charmed situation where artists are still alive and conservators and conservation scientists have the opportunity to talk with them and to gauge their opinions and to document their opinions in relation to the treatment of their works. And I think that's the responsibility that we have now to engage in those discussions before we move forwards um, in, in treatments. Okay? Sorry, Antonio. <laughs> Glad to. Thank you very much for this full immersion in the plastic world. As a chemist, I feel perfectly comfortable. So. <laughs> <laughs>